Thank you so much. Welcome to FAQ 147. You guys are amazing with the questions, by the way. Did I tell you that? Keep them coming, okay? By the way, for you guys who don't know, who are new to this, I'm Ola England. I'm a YouTuber. I'm in a couple bands, The Haunted and Feared. And uh, what else? Solar Guitars. It's a brand that I have. I'm president. Great. First question. Burnt Gerbil. Hey Ola, fact question. I'm curious to know the story behind band names. Where did The Haunted and Feared come from? Is there a story or was it just we need a name? Thanks. Okay, so actually a pretty fun story, I must say. Uh, the origins of The Haunted, I have no idea. I wasn't part of the band when they started. I don't know why they got The Haunted as a name. I, I have no idea, but when I started Feared, and this was before me being The Haunted, by the way, when I started Fear back in 2007, I actually thought that The Haunted was a fucking kick-ass band name. You know, The Haunted had a slogan, The Haunted made me do it. Everyone took that slogan and made their own thing about it. You know, whatever made me do it. You know, Budweiser made me do it, or yeah, Carlsberg made me do it. Everyone took that slogan and just stole the shit out of it. But The Haunted made me do it was basically the first guys who coined that reference. You know, back in 2007, I started my new band and I thought The Haunted was such a kick-ass band name. That's when I came up with Feared. It's basically the same type of band name. It's something that's feared, basically. At first I wanted to have Fear as band name, but there's an old punk band called Fear. So uh, it became Feared. And it's actually inspired by The Haunted that I'm now a part of. Isn't that fucking weird? <laughs> How that works. It just shows that, you know, I was influenced by The Haunted before I joined The Haunted. Does it mean anything? Feared? I don't know. What do I know? Tauno Kekkonen. I'm gonna go on an old man's rampage rant here. Back in the day, signature guitars were for celebrated and revered guitarists. For me, it was next to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, music man Sterling has both John Petrucci and Jared Dines on their roster. Comparison has Matthias I, e, I, Aikland and Courtney Cox, Ivan S. Stevie and Mick Thompson. Like, what the actual heck? Who's next? My mom? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, with this, I think he's trying to say that the second name that he's mentioning uh, is maybe not worthy of a signature guitar. So, like in the Music Man case, that Jared Dines is not worthy of a signature guitar, that Courtney Cox is not worthy of a signature guitars, uh, guitar or that Mick Thompson, for one, is not worthy of a signature guitar, at least in Taunu and his eyes. And I understand what you're saying right here, that maybe, you know, everyone has signature guitar gear nowadays. I understand that. It's not as much of a prestige to have a signature guitar. I mean, back during the 90s, John Petrucci, Steve I, Dimebag, you know, all the top artists had signature guitars, and for a really, really good reason. And now in the more social medialized world, there are just a lot more signature artists out there. I for one think that Jared Dines is well worthy of having a signature guitar because he has inspired a lot of new guitar players and kids out there to start playing guitar. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? To just inspire people to pick up the guitar and play more guitar? I think there's a worth in that. Maybe he doesn't have the, the same, you know, album weight as John Petrucci and, you know, Steve Vai, but he has brought something else to the table that I think is worth a signature guitar. Now, it's not my decision who gets a signature guitar or who does not get a signature guitar, but as long as there's a worth in it, I don't really see it being much of a problem. And comparing Ivan as Steve I and Mick Thompson, I mean, Steve Vai is obviously a very huge uh, influence for a lot of guitar players. He's, you know, the, the RG is basically his work and, you know, the gem guitars and all that. But Mick Thompson is the next generation of male guitar players out there. I mean, he's super significant and Slipknot is obviously a, a very, very big band. So I think comparing the two, uh, you can't really. They've done different things that have been really good for the guitar community. So, I mean, you can't really measure 
the worth of having a signature guitar with the amounts of albums you made you can't really nowadays I understand what you're saying, but I don't agree Tano, thank you for the question, ok? Giovanna Rodriguez Hola, what's the hardest riff you learned when you were a beginner? Yes, great question So, one of the first riffs I, I learned and obviously I think it was the first riff for a lot of people was the uh, Smoke... Uh, Smoke and Mirrors by Symphony X No, that's a very very tough one No, Smoke on the Water, so... That's a very hard riff uh, but it's also easy if you're a beginner but uh, one of the hardest riffs that I tried to learn and I was working a lot with this when I was a beginner was the main riff for Mouth of War which is an absolute banger one of my favorite riffs of all time there weren't any tabs back in the day so I tried to listen to the CD and try to mimic what he was playing which was really hard because they were also tuning to 425 Hz which is not, not what I was tuned to but I came to the conclusion that it was like this uh, and this was how I played it back in the day when I was starting it out and I was like oh shit I got it now it's like this and I was like freaking hell that sounds amazing that's not how you play it like that's not how Dimebag plays it but you know that for me was such a hard ass riff back in the day now Dimebag is playing it like this and I think the problem was just getting the in-between was a little weird just getting the slides right and you know where to put the, the, the low E back you know that was really hard when I started out but it's one of my favorite riffs of all time it's an excellent riff and I still enjoy playing it a lot but it was really tough to nail back in the day when I was trying it out but uh, you know my first band we played that to hell and back we just love Pantera and Simple Tour and all that we just played covers all day of their songs it was amazing amazing time when I was a, a teenager Vince Vato hey man I hope everything is going well for you and the family I was wondering if you can help me out with something I started to stream on Twitch a couple months ago and I want to start streaming myself playing guitar but I have trouble figuring out how to do it would you be able to show tell me or show your setup you're rolling with because I saw you using a Bluetooth headset while playing guitar and I gotta say I have no clue how you made that work hearing yourself from that headset lol please help okay let's go in to the Twitch room real quick all right, we're going in to the Twitch room. So, okay, this is the spot where I stream from, right? I know you guys love my cable management right here. It looks amazing. Thank you, appreciate it. I've been working really hard with this to make this look like this. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the support you guys are giving me because of that. So let me show you my stream setup for a little bit. And uh, you were asking in particular how I do with the headphones and all that. So, okay, I have this which is my main streaming computer right this is the keyboard this is my mouse for that I also have this as an audio interface but that's not all I have for the sound I also have this which is just a Behringer mixer this is not that expensive to get and uh, basically what I do here is that I connect everything I have through this mixer so this FM3 fractal that I have on the floor right here is connected to this mixer and then here is my mixer where I can set my uh, what I'm listening to and like the audio that goes to Twitch for instance so this Go XLR is really good if you're a streamer it has a bunch of different effects it has a mixer and uh, yeah it, it's it's really good for streaming I must say and you can bleep shit and you know you can put on different sounds and whatnot so I have it set up so my music is here this is my chat my microphone this microphone right here that I talk through that's this little lever right there I can mute that on and off if uh, I'm performing then I have music over here and then I have system and system is basically this and that is the guitar sound right there so I can uh, adjust the guitar sound so it fits well with the music and vice versa but to be able to hear all of this while I'm playing uh, you said you were using Bluetooth uh, that's not going to work that good because Bluetooth introduces a lot of lag into your signal so I'm actually using these which are Steel Series Pro they're also wireless headphones but they're not on Bluetooth they're on the regular RF uh, which is regular wireless and it's streamed through this so the lag is very very slight I would say it's 
close to non-existent. It's not non-existent, but it's there and it affects a little bit, but not as much as Bluetooth. So I have a cable going from this audio interface going into this thing right there. And that is what I'm listening to while I'm performing songs. So that's in short how I have everything hooked up in my Twitch stream setup right here. Does that make any sense? Hope I answered the question. Let's head back, okay? That's, uh, that's how I do it. <laughs> Brett Limbaton, have you heard the new Mr. Bungle album? It sounds killer. Are you familiar with the other albums? They wrote some batshit insane stuff. Yes, I have listened to the new album. I forgot about the name though. <laughs> Uh, what is it? It's uh, the Raging Wrath of the Easter Bunny demo. And supposedly, these are supposed to be demo songs from 1986. And you know who's on board? Scott Ian and Dave Lombardo. And holy shit, man, this album is batshit insane. I mean, the previous Mr. Bungle, they're also batshit insane with, you know, different instruments and, you know, the brass section and the saxophones and whatnot. It's just, it's batshit insane. That, that's a really good way to describe a Mr. Bungle. But this, the new album, is basically one of the better thrash albums I've heard in a good while. And it might be because the demos and songs were made in 19, in 1986. It's just like raining blood in a way. Holy shit, man. There's just so much energy to this album. And you know what? If you listen to it, go listen to it now. It just sounds so real. If you listen to it, it's such a, it's such a breath of fresh air, man. I mean, it's just so organic sounding. The drums sound like real drums and, you know, not clickety clickety motherfucker out there. The guitars are just perfect. And it's, it's just a live sounding album. And it's such, it's such a pleasure to listen to this album. I'm really enjoying the new Mr. Bungle album. California is otherwise a really good uh, album that I listen a lot to. Disco Volante, also batshit insane. I mean, this new one, I would compare it more to Dead Cross, which was uh, Mike Patton's other album release that they released uh, two or three years ago. Uh, it, that's also very, very much metal. But this new Mr. Bungle album with the demos, it's just pure thrash metal. And it's fucking brilliant. And Mike Patton, as always, is... He's just, oh my god, he's just on top of things. And Scott Ian and Dave Lombardo, what a fucking team, man. It's like a super group. Go listen to it, it's absolutely amazing. Do yourself a favor, uh, you're not gonna regret it. Pato Arias, hi Ola, how can you manage to do bendings using an Evertune bridge? Great question. A lot of people, they think that you can't bend on an Evertune, but that's wrong. You can bend on an Evertune. <laughs> you can bend on an every tune. It's just a matter of how you set up the tension of the string. So right now, uh, what people think is that when you're uh, playing an every tune, that this is what's going to happen when you bend. Nothing basically. Well, a little bit is happening actually. But. To properly set up an Evertune bridge, you need to tune it at the bridge and then set the tension using the tuners on the guitar headstock. So, you go to the part where the string goes sharp and then you back it down. Then you have a bendable string. Easy as that. There's a misconception that you can't bend on an Evertune. Well, you just have to educate yourself. Okay? Thank you. That's what I'm here for. I made a bunch of videos on the Evertune Bridge. Mac Anthony, hey Ola, how long does it usually take for you to warm up before filming a guitar related video? Are you able to just pick up a guitar for the first time in one or two days and gallop at insane speeds? Or does it take you a while to build up endurance and speed? Much love from a 15 year old in Australia. That's amazing. Mac Anthony, I've said it before, but the only times where I'm actually playing guitar is when I'm doing the videos or when I'm recording a new song or doing solos. Uh, I don't really play that much guitar. And for a video like this, for instance, or like a demo video, I don't really warm up at all. It's just me throwing myself into the situation and that's basically what it is. And uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but I just like to kind of challenge myself to just go in, you know, headbutt into a, a video. I, for one, think that it creates a better outcome in a video. Obviously, if I'm not prepared and I'm playing like shit, that, that, that's sad. That is sad. But uh, yeah, I, I usually just jump myself in. Sometimes if I play, you know, Preachers of Death. 
if I play that for a thousand hours, then it's obviously gonna tire up my arm. But uh, I don't have a problem just going into that. Uh, I didn't prepare before this video, for instance. I definitely know I can do better, but I don't. <laughs> Half-assed answer to a great question. I'm sorry, thank you. Chase H, AAA Ola, how much uh, music do you listen to in the average week, minutes, hours? And do you ever listen to your own music casually? You know, since I'm working with music a lot and, you know, my own music, I don't tend to listen that much to my own music. Uh, when it's done, I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> Okay, I don't want to hear my music, but obviously I have to listen to it when I'm playing and you know doing uh, Twitch live streams or whatever and playthroughs. Then I listen to my songs and I play along to them. That's fine. But uh, new music, I try to keep myself updated with what's current, and you know to be able to maybe I can hear something new that's new and exciting, and you know maybe that will inspire me. But uh, in in a day, I don't really listen that much to music. It happens. When I'm riding a car, usually I talk on Discord with my uh, members, but uh, it's not very often that I listen to music, actually. Uh, I don't know. It's just... I just want silence nowadays. Is that weird? That I just want peace and quiet? I don't know. I don't listen that much. When I was a teenager, I was listening all the time. Day in and day out. I had the earbuds on, you know, my portable CD or whatever it was, like a mini disc as well. I had a mini disc and a, a, a Walkman. I had a Walkman, and I was listening to music constantly. But no, not nowadays. Voronsky, hey Ola, since you are now working on the guitar solos for your second solo album, could you walk us through your solo writing process? Also, what has your gear set up for this recording been like so far? Pliny or real amps? Okay, so. Thank you. Great question. So the process for me recording solos for my solo album is basically I have a section. Uh, I can't show it now because I'm recording in Logic. <laughs> but basically what I do is that if I have a solo section with chords and everything in the background, I just cycle record that part. So that means that it just push record and then it just records over and over. And then I sit and improvise to that. <laughs> And eventually, when I come up with something that's, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, I cut that out, and then I continue. And then I somewhat build a solo from the ground up. It's not a, it's not much of an improvisation solo. I wouldn't say this. It it's basically me building a solo from zero to 100%. And that's just how I like to work. I found that to be the best approach for me, because I'm not really that good with improv. And, uh, but, in some extent, I do improv because that's you have to start somewhere, right? So I do improv, and uh, then I cut bits and pieces out of there. And uh, at the end of the day, I usually have a solo. And for recording this, he's asking uh, what the gear setup is. Uh, I don't really have a gear setup when it comes to you know. I don't have to. I don't. I'm not recording through real amps when I'm recording. When I'm recording, I always record DI. And I just have the guitar straight into my audio interface, which is an Apple G Ensemble right now. And that's it. I'm using Pliny uh, Neural DSP plugin just for, uh, just for, uh, what do you, just to audition, you know, what I'm doing at the time. So, uh, but I haven't decided. I mean, uh, the album will be mixed by Yuki Skog, and it's up to him really. You know, I want him to have his take on it. And uh, if it's a real amp, if it's a fake amp, whatever, man, as long as it sounds as good as it can be, then I'm happy. Uh, thank you so much. Great question. Spyware 1100. Question for the next FAQ. You mentioned that now you don't have any sponsored gear content. Is that the reason why we can't see any Hesu gear nowadays in your videos? What happened to those Hesu cabs that you used very often in the past? Or you just don't like the brand anymore? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Well, you know, I, I wasn't really sponsored by Hesu or anything like that. Uh, the Hesu cabinets, they're still here, by the way. Uh, right behind this camera. And uh, I used them a lot in, in my apartment because in my apartment, my room was small and I needed a 2x12. The reason why I'm not using them now is because now I'm in the office, I can use a 4x12. And if I can use a 4x12, I use a 4x12. So there's that. I, but I did use the cabinet in, the, in a recent video and I'll probably, you know, mix it out a little bit. Now I have more cabinets, I'll probably do a cabinet shootout. I'll definitely use the Hesu. I still like the brand, I still like the speakers. Uh, it's just, you know, if I have a 4x12, I play a 4x12. There's not really any scheme other than, you know, me playing 4x12s. <laughs> you know, I go through phases where I favor a lot of things, and when I favor something, I use it. You know, like the Mesa Oversized Cabinet, I mean, I purchased it. 
I fucking love it. That's why I use it in a lot of videos because you know it inspires me and inspires my playing. And that's why I keep using you know the same piece of gear over and over. It's because I just thoroughly enjoy using that piece of gear. So there's not really any idea behind what I pick and choose for a certain demo. Right now I'm trying to build up uh, you know my cabinet situation so I have different cabinets for you know and I can match cabinet with an amplifier or gear. But yeah. Sometimes I just, you know, pick the thing that's closest to me because it's the simplest way. Uh, so there you go. I think I answered the question. Thank you. Kevin Yuri, thoughts on having successful channel only using a phone camera and music gear, besides extremely hard starting from scratch? Well, in my understanding, the gear doesn't really matter as long as the content is really fucking good. You mean, it, I mean, you can see on my channel, I'm upping up the, the gear instead of the content <laughs> to be able to bring you, you know, good looking videos and just have the smoke and mirrors that the content is good uh, when it's not. <laughs> you know, I've been having my channel for about 10 years and, you know, I want to push the limits of what I can do. So that's why I have a really good camera setup and all that, because, you know, I enjoy that. I enjoy pushing the, the envelope of what I can do. But with that said, there's so much you can do with an iPhone today or, you know, any fucking phone camera. And uh, I'm gonna give you a tip of a guy that I followed and I, I it, he's just, it's just him sitting on a bed in his bedroom, you know, talking. And it's uh, Red Light, is it Red Light Blue? I think the channel is called. It's basically uh, just a random dude sitting on his, uh, on his bed trying to learn guitar and trying to become better at guitar. And his videos are so genuine. They're really well edited. And it's basically just him sitting on his bed. <laughs> he has about 100,000 subscribers and I think that, if anything, is a good testament that the gear doesn't matter. It's all about the content. So, uh, good shout out to this guy right here, Red Light Blue. Um, go follow his channel. I put a link in the description. It's a channel I, I like to watch. I don't follow it at all times, but sometimes he puts out a video that sparks my interest. I watch and I enjoy it. There you go. That was FAQ 147. I hope you enjoyed it. Please continue to put questions in the comment section on this video and you might get featured in the next FAQ. How about that? Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much, all my beautiful members as well. Love you guys. See ya. Oh, is, there, is that a crotch cam? Look at that.